Hi. Doing, doing great. Pretty good. I'm glad to hear it. Okay, we're now recording. My name is David Shear. We're uh, doing a review session for Physics 572. Uh, those who are joining us after the fact by, by uh, Panopto, welcome. I hope this will be helpful for everybody. We have a test coming up uh, soon. Uh, after this session is over, we'll make it available for about a week. So people will have their chance to, I hope they'll have uh, plenty of, of uh, choices for when to, to complete that. Um, what I want to do now is just review what we've done uh, over the last uh, little while uh, and, and emphasize the things that are, are most important. Um, we started off with a section on external dose symmetry. So one thing I think is important for you to re remember or be able to um, understand is the difference between uh, how we assess charged particles uh, dose to the charged particles and photons. They're different. So in the charged particles, we have, um, it's the flux, the dose rate is the flux times, here we go, right here, times the stopping power, the mass stopping power. This is energy per unit distance, and this is uh, per square centimeter. So this works out to um, energy per unit volume, and this is mass per unit volume, and so it works out to be energy per mass. Okay, the, you don't need to worry about the energy of the electrons. That's all figured out as part of the, the S. When you do the, um, uh, 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 for photons, where we have it, uh, it is uh, down here somewhere. The, uh, well, the, the difference is that in, in, when, when we look at the, the dose due to photons, it's the fluence times the energy times the uh, absorption coefficient. It's somewhere in this maybe, right there. Come on. The, the dose is the fluence times the energy times the absorption coefficient. So for photons, the fluence is just the numbers. It doesn't have any energy information in it, so you have to add that in. For charged particles, it's the stopping power, and you don't put the energy into the equation. Okay, So that's one difference that's important to recognize on sort of a theoretical level. Um, and next thing, you, um, concept to consider or that, that's important is the difference between the attenuation coefficient and the absorption coefficient. Okay, and that's got to do with these ratios of how much energy is imparted to the uh, charged particles, how much of it's transferred over to them. Um, and so we have these ratios. It's important to understand that's what gives rise to the difference between the absorption coefficient and the uh, attenuation coefficient. Okay. Um, um, can't answer right now. Okay. I apologize for that. Um, another concept. Yeah, so the difference between attenuation coefficient, uh, the difference between karma and absorbed dose is another concept you need to, to understand. This is all about how it, these are all parts of this equation here. All these subsequent slides are how that energy difference gets figured out. Difference between karma and um, absorbed dose. And so, um, uh, so that is, there's a slide here that has a comparison between them. Um, uh, the absorbed dose is uh, something that can actually be measured with instruments. The karma is something that's easy to calculate. Um, and uh, the difference, they, they become essentially the same concept when you achieve, or the same value, when you achieve charged particle equilibrium. So uh, at the surface of a mass, when, energy is being transferred to electrons, but some of that energy is carried deeper into the medium. But eventually you get to the point where the energy carried into a mass is equal to the energy being pulled out of, transferred out. And so you have equilibrium of the electrons. 
uh, that's that's when the absorbed dose and the karma are equal. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, that's a concept you need to understand. Uh, understand the um, uh, uh, the whole concept of exposure as an early measure of uh, uh, radiation strength of energy deposited by radiation. How it, um, uh, what that's all about, that it's ionization in air, that there's, you know, 34 electron volts per um, uh, ion that's created. So that energy is being, that's a measure of the energy that's deposited. Um, and so how uh, the Rankin can be, uh, uh, what the, what a Rankin is, how it's measured, and how it, um, uh, correlates to karma and dose. So one Rankin gives a, a air karma uh, to a, a dose to air of 87.7 uh, millirads or 800, well, 8.77 milligray, so 877 millirads and uh, uh, like 95, 0.95 uh, uh, rads to tissue. Okay. Um, Think maybe definitions of these concepts of uh, the particle rate, the fluence, um, uh, energy fluence. Uh, we talked about how you calculate the fluence uh, as a fra uh, the number of particles that are emitted, uh, and it's divided by the the surface of a sphere, four pi r squared, and that gives rise to the inverse square law because the fluence is getting smaller as you get further away. So the dose is getting smaller as you get further away. Let's see. Okay, uh, I think that's what we had for this one. For the next lecture, we talked about occupational dosimetry. So understanding quality factor and radiation weighting factor. Quality factor is an older concept. It's still used by the NRC. Radiation weighting factor is a more recent concept, um, but they're the same. Conceptually, they're very similar. The values are different, and that's later in the slide. Um, uh, what it, dose equivalent or equivalent dose is? The old term when they use quality factor was dose equivalent. Um, when they use radiation weighting factor, it's called equivalent dose. It's just a linguistic way of tipping you off as to what um, assumptions are being used. Um, what the effective dose is, so that's the uh, the dose equivalent times the tissue weighting factors. You're not going to memorize the tissue weighting factors, but just generally know what they are and what they are used for. Um, let's see what the uh, here's a, a an example of the radiation weighting factor, how it changed over time. This is the old version for um, uh, that was used uh, by the, still used by the NRC, and then over time it was it has been reassessed. The DOE uses the either the blue uh, step function, which is a table of values, or there's a, 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 a function of, of energy that the DOE uh, ICRP sixty came up with. Um, and these are the different tissue weighting factors how they have evolved over time. I don't know that, again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize the numerical values, but uh, understand that there are differences, and so they can't just all of a sudden be um, equated. So, for example, the uh, the breast is one that really strikes me. You know, it, it was 0.15, then it wound up, went down to 0.05, and then back up to 0.12. So it's changed over time, uh, and it's important to know which system you're working with so you understand the meaning of what you're reading. Uh, effective dose, we talked about that in the last slide. It's the tissue weighting factor multiplied by the dose equivalent. Um, uh, it's called, as I said, it's effective dose when you're dealing with the newer system, ICRP 60 or ICRP 103. It was called effective dose equivalent under the old system, uh, ICRP 27. Need to know what the regulatory limits are. Um, all these values, five rem per year to the whole body. Whole body is everything um, above the elbows and above the knees. 50 rem to the extremity, that's the, knee, the elbows and knees down. 
uh, 50 round to the skin. That's at the highest point on the body. Lens of the eye is 15 rem. Uh, and dose to the, the only limit for the general public is 500 millirem or 100, or 100 millirem, depending. It's 500 millirem for a specific dose, 100 millirem, generally speaking, um, when you consider all, uh, uh, you know, not a specific case. Um, occupational model, we need to know something. Let's see. Uh, something about monitoring devices, what they're used for, what they assess. So you use a, you might use one device. You might use, um, whole body dose, a separate device to measure extremities, et cetera. Yes, John. Uh, could you explain that specific, um, like 500 versus 100 uh, millisievert dose? I will do my best. And the, the best way I'm going to do be able to do that is go to the rule. Okay, and it okay. cannot make any mistakes. Okay. And let's see. Uh, members of the public. Okay, so for individual members of the public. So if you're calculating a, a dose to an individual. It is, uh, where are we? Okay. Let's see if we can find where we're. Those are the members of the public. It's 100 millirem, generally speaking. Um, okay, and there's a restriction that it's uh, 2 millirem in any one hour. Uh, the 500 millirems comes about yeah right here uh you a uh, licensee may permit a visitor an individual uh so someone who's visiting a patient in a hospital cannot be released to 500 millirem and uh a licensee may apply for uh uh an exception to allow up to 500 millirem to members of the public the general reason why this rule was adopted was they didn't want to have to make everybody go back and retrofit everything when they adopted the 100 millirem limit. So the 500 millirem limit had been in place for many, many years. And so, um, for example, shielding had been designed to protect the public from 500 millirem. And so they would allow individuals to, to um, receive up to 500 millirem if they uh, uh, asked for specific permission, you know, if the licensee got specific permission, but in general, if it's just uh, uh, people, in, in the public at large, and, and for example, effluents that are gonna affect large number of people, then the, the limit needs to be 100. Does that make it clear? Because uh, it's not 100% clear to me uh, um, that how helps. they apply it. Yeah. It's just, I think it's the, the main point is that it provides them flexibility so they don't have to impose these rules on everybody. Okay. Let's move on. Um, so we know what parts, what the whole body is, what the extremities are. We know what the tissues are. The skin is, yeah, we don't need, at this, for this question, we don't need to talk about the depth of tissue, uh, depth of where radiations are measured. Um, so I don't think I'll probably ask you how a, a dosimeter works. Uh, internal dosimetry. Okay. So, um, it's based on the same concept of effective dose or effective dose equivalent. And I'm highlighted, there we go. Uh, this is um, measured in units of Sievert, obviously. Uh, and this applies, uh, the, the whole concept of effective dose was first uh, uh, developed for the, the situation of internal dosimetry because the, the um, radiation that's delivered is inherently unequal. For external exposure, we generally assume the whole body is exposed to the same amount of radiation. That's not always true. For example, with a point source, it can have a, a higher, um, you know, your body's uh, spread out over some distance. And so uh, a, a dose at one point might be different from a dose that you're 
a belly button might be different than the dose at the top of your head, depending on where the source is. Um, so, um, but we generally have, uh, we in most cases, we assume that the external dose is uniform across the whole body uh, because it's a simpler assumption. That, that has no bearing at all when it comes to internal doses. Uh, radioisotopes uh, uh, accumulate in individual organs, uh, most of them. There, there are some like uh, tritium, like water that goes throughout the body, sodium that goes throughout the body, but many, many isotopes accumulate in one type of tissue or another. So you pretty much have to come up with some scheme that accounts for that difference. Otherwise, everybody would be overexposed if you just went by the highest dose. And so it was developed first in that uh, for this purpose, but it's now used for everything. It's used for external exposure. It's used for, for everything. We've already talked about weighting factors. Um, uh, so let's see, that's not really, I mean, you, th these uh, basically decide the, uh, describe the idea. Um, isotopes in one organ can irradiate other organs. And so we've got to figure that out. Um, there are two portions to the calculation, or three portions to the calculation technique. Uh, one is the kinetic data, the, the way it gets distributed, how much time each isotope spends in each organ. That's all based on this math of the, um, the uh, what are called catenary models, those, these equations that explain how much material is, is in each organ at a, a given time. Uh, the second is a radiological material, the how, uh, what the uh, half-life is, what the um, energy per, per radiation is, and what how frequent the radiation is. Um, the third portion of it is this transport model, where um, the, the radiation from one organ uh, shines on another organ. And so um, those three things go together to make up the dose. All this, this modeling for um, where one organ irradiates other organs is called the specific effective energy. Everything in this equation uh, has to do with um, uh, this phi, has to do with the, the amount of, of energy transported between. If it's in one organ and it shines on another, that's this is the source organ irradiating a target organ. Um, the the uh, NI and the EI are the uh, radiological things. This is this frequency here and the, the energy. That's what the NI and the EI are. The mass is, is uh, just, you know, part of the, the, uh, the computational model. We, we model how much mass each tissue has. Uh, and so all those are the three components that go into it. Um, this is the transport model that gets you the phi or the SEE. Um, they call, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is another example of biokinetics, just showing it can get more complicated. You know, it's not as simple as uh, just using an effective half-life like we had for the simple one compartment model. It was just effective half-life is made up by the biological and physical part. It gets more complicated mathematically. There are more complex equations, but that doesn't really matter to us who are users of this information. There's another complicated model. This is the lung model, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, thing that's important to rec recognize is that there are different routes of intake, and that has an impact on how this stuff gets uh, the biokinetics, either whether it's ingestion or inhalation or injection for that matter. That's not very common uh, for um, occupational work. We did, sh sh looked at an example of the radium dial painters, and you did a homework problem of dosimetry uh, for radium workers. Um, uh, that was one of the very earliest problems that was uh, dealt with, and um, uh, uh, it was sort of kicked off the whole um, enterprise of internal dosimetry. Uh, we had this interesting story of a, a guy just a few years ago who was poisoned with radiation. And I don't know why this is out of order, but then there are, we're talking about for inhalation, the, the air particle size, the, the size of the particle makes a difference as to where it ends up in the body. Um, and this is the lung model. Uh, oh, and, and it's important to understand that there are different classes, uh, clearance classes. Um, in the NRC world, it's D, W, or Y for it 
clear as the scale of days, weeks, or years. In the uh, uh, DOE world from ICRP60, it's FM or S, fast, moderate, or slow. Just understand that you have to characterize what kind of material you're dealing with, and then your, your uh, dose, uh, the symmetry all changes depending on that. Uh, this is once again the limits uh, that we, we saw last time, same slide, same information. And, but what we do in practice as practicing health physicists is not use these models to develop uh, all the, uh, the, um, the, the symmetry. We look up values that other people have calculated for us. And so the kinds of problems you will deal with in your work is given an exposure or given an intake of a certain amount of activity, what is the dose? And you look up that this is dose per, uh, per activity, in this case, Siebert per Becquerel. And so you can figure out what the dose to any organ is or to the um, effective dose equivalent in this case is. Okay, that's true for, this is uh, ingestion. This is a one for, I think, inhalation. Okay, so that that's what we, how we, the kind of problem we need to do. It gets reduced a step further when we talk about occupational dose. Um, in, in the case of occupational dose, uh, we don't have to go back and calculate all the individual organ doses. It's done it, the the dose the important dose coefficients are provided for us in the rules. Okay, so you will have either NRC or 10 CFR uh, uh, DOE rules. In the NRC rules, you go to Appendix B of Part 20. You go to the nuclide you're interested in, and you can find what the alleys are and what the DAC is, okay? These are equivalent to a dose. Th this activity will deliver a dose of uh, 5 rem in this case, because there's no tissue that's specified. In the DAC, exposure of, to this concentration for 2,000 hours will give a, do a dose of 5 rem, okay? Being able to use these is an important uh, part of the problem. Let's see. Um, sometimes in the table, there is a do an alley that's linked to an organ. So 30 microcuries in this case of ingestion will give 50 rem to the thyroid. 90 microcuries of ing ingested will give 5 rem effective dose equivalent. Okay, so understanding how to interpret these tables. Uh, for inhalation, it's the same. This inhalation amount, 50 microcuries, gives rise to 50 rem to the thyroid, and 200 microcuries inhaled <clears throat> gives rise to um, 5 rem effective dose equivalent. Now, uh, they've also got a DAC. That's the derived air concentration. Given the most restrictive alley, breathing at this concentration for 2,000 hours also delivers the same, by, in this case, 50 rem to the thyroid, okay? If, and yeah, if you breathe, if you have an intake of this magnitude, it would be five rem effect dose equivalent, okay? Um, this is an example of how we do those calculations based on DAC hours. We take our, um, our concentration, Let's see. Well, this this is just telling us the DAC is based on 20 liters per minute um, exposure. That's it's get going from the alley to the DAC. That's what that calculation is doing. Uh, this is the one that tells us how to assess uh, compliance based on DAC hours. So if we take our uh, concentration that we're exposed to times the amount of time that we're exposed to divided by the DAC, that gives us our DAC hours. And 2,000 DAC hours is equivalent to our annual dose limit. So far, so good. Speak up if I'm uh, not helping. Um, when we want to look at what, when we're dealing with airborne hazards, uh, we need to know the class, as I've already mentioned, whether it's D, Y, or W. Uh, and if you go to an isotope, it, it will tell you it, it, not every isotope has the information. It's the first entry in the table that tells you 
what the classes are. So you, if it says C strontium 80 in this case, that's the first uh, isotope for strontium. So you have to go back and look and find out what chemicals are of class D and what chemicals are class Y. The class D chemicals are uh, cleared uh, quickly. They're, they're usually soluble chemicals and they're um, washed out of the body. Class Y chemicals uh, can last a very long time in the lungs. Okay, uh, and the same thing for F, M, and S. Those S let's stay in the lungs for a very long time. Another class in, in the um, uh, rules is uh, deals with submersion doses. So in 10 CFR 20, um, we have some nuclides, let's say, uh, pick a, a noble gas, let's say argon, 37. In the table, it tells us the class is submersion. This, this, this is a noble gas. It's not taken in and accumulated in the body. The, the dose is due to the external exposure from the gas being all around us. It's an internal uh, isotope because it's unsealed. It's not just gamma. Well, it is just gamma rays. But the radiation is treated as a loose radioactive material because it's airborne. Uh, but the, the exposure is not due to metabolism of the, the activity. It's an external dose rate. And so there isn't going to, for a gas like that, there will not be an oral ingestion alley. There won't be an inhalation alley. It's not about how much you take in. It's just what concentration would give rise to five rem per year external exposure. Okay. Um, and there's an example, the same example. I didn't have to pull it over. So it's conceptually different. Um, now, the other thing is we have to combine, we're, we're interested in the total effective dose equivalent that includes external doses and our uh, committed doses, the stochastic committed doses to get the total effective dose equivalent. Remember, effective dose equivalent is that weighted, tissue weighted uh, uh, sum. Um, we treat the external doses as though they are irradiating the whole body uniformly. Uh, we treat the um, the C uh, we the, the CED is equivalent to a whole body dose, so we just add those up. Um, uh, the uh, TEDE must be less than five rem. Individual organ doses, you have the same org external dose that's assumed to irradiate everything, including individual organs, plus the committed dose that we calculated for the individual organ. Okay. The, the one that was not in parentheses that had a tissue name to it. Now, this is all um, assessed on the maximum uh, uh, organ dose for, for uh, rather than, if, you don't have to uh, calculate up for each individual organ. Uh, for each isotope, you're only concerned about the maximum organ, uh, the, the, the organ that receives the maximum dose. Okay, and we have similar tables for uh, 10 CFR, 835 for the Department of Energy. In, in this case, we don't have alleys. In, in, in the DOE world, all we have are derived air concentrations that are presented in the rules. There's for FM and a fast, medium, and slow type. It's in traditional units or it's in SI units. And on the right, it tells us whether this is a stochastic dose, uh, uh, for the upper airway, for bone surfaces, what tissue is being irradiated, okay? And these uh, def uh, symbols are defined in the footnotes of the table. So we did some calculations, we did the homework, um, and you can look these over. That You might see a problem with something like this. Okay, um, uh, we should briefly mention... Um, uh, when you have, uh, when you do um, uh, uh, bioassay counting, either whole body counting or tissue samples, the, the method for doing, determining the dose is you take your sample or your count from the whole body count. You use a table called the intake retention function tables. And I don't have them on here. You figure out what the original intake was and then use that original intake to calculate the dose. You can't go directly 
from either the, the lab test or the bio the, the whole body count and, and take that directly to dose. So you use the whole body count to figure out the intake, then use the intake to figure out the dose. Questions? Okay, next one. Uh, this is a, a brief one we did on, uh, basically it was showing you what the gamma constant is for a particular isotope and how it's derived. The important point is that many calculations can be accomplished in a straightforward way by using the gamma constant. The gamma constant, it tells you, uh, what you have to look at whatever table you're looking at and find out what the units are. But in this case, for any given isotope, this is the external exposure rate from a particular, from, from a point source at one meter. In this case, it's in millisieverts per hour per mega becquerel. Um, it's, uh, this is in curies per hour, uh, I mean, excuse me, Rankin per hour at one meter per curie, this older form. So a lot, there's no reason to go through all the steps in, in some homework assignments. We went through a lot of steps to derive the dose rate at a meter. In many cases, and certainly when you're practicing in, in, in the field, you will just simply use a gamma constant to determine what the dose rate is. You won't go back to the, the prime, uh, the, the basic physics of it. We went through these exercises so that you would understand where these gamma constants come from, that they are in fact real, and that you can, when you have some disagreement, you'll be able to judge between them. Um, another thing that is worth mentioning, I don't remember where I showed, uh, uh, where is, Ox, I think Ox, there is a, maybe it's, there's a, uh, uh, a general formula that is valuable. This is external. Yeah, this is this is gonna be it. Uh, a, a, a general rule that is widely valuable is that you can get this gamma constant. I don't know where 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 it is in the notes, but the value of the gamma constant can be estimated as one half times the uh, number of photons per uh, disintegration times the number of curies times the energy. So I don't remember where it is in here, but I, I know I put that formula in here for you. So one half NC, here it is right here. One half NCE R per hour at a foot, I mean a meter. That's a, a good approximation for many isotopes from 100 keV to 3 MeV. You can see that this is relatively flat, the dose rate. Um, and at one, uh, at a, at six NCE at a foot, and the difference between the half and the six is just inverse square law, okay? So those are numbers that, that are fairly easy to use uh, if you don't have a table, particularly if you're in the field, but it's also, as you saw when I worked out the homework, it's a good way to check your your um, yourself to see if the, the answer you came up with in solving a problem makes sense. It's to see if you're in the right order of magnitude. And if not, you can ask questions of yourself. Systems of radiological protection. So primarily we're talking about the ICRP and the NCRP systems. Uh, they're very similar. The three principles that are involved are justification, optimization, and application of limits. Okay. Uh, I think everybody uh, uh, did a good job of explaining that to my recollection. Um, the limits are what we, I, I described the NRC limits before. The um, ICRP limits are a little different. Uh, they are now, the, the current ICR limits are two rem per year, not five rem per year uh, effective dose. Um, the NCRP has uh, equivalent recommendations that are very similar. Ah, that, that's because this was an earlier system. The um, ICRP-60 is now uh, two rem per year on average. You can, you can have five rem in a year, but over the course of five years, uh, you can only have 10 rem. Um, uh, also, they've reduced the dose to the lens of the eye more recently. Okay, um, 
there are three exposure situations, occupational exposures, public exposures, medical exposures. These are reflected in the rules as well. Medical exposures are excluded from the regulations. Um, there are planned special exposures. So you have a separate account of dose that workers can receive for um, infrequent activities. They can receive up to the annual dose uh, in addition for a planned special exposure, but there's also a lifetime cap. Uh, the, the low dose limits don't apply to emergency workers in urgent situations. Um, uh, let's see. And so they're very similar, but they, they differ in some of the details. Okay. Um, do I have questions about this? Finally, uh, no, not finally. Next, we talked about the right. So we have the standards. The standards are the basis for regulation. We talk about what the different regulations are under 10 CFR Part 20, uh, what the fuel cycle is. So there might be, um, it would be good to have some understanding of the fuel cycle and um, uh, what it what it means. It's that fuel. That's the process of how fuel is uh, produced from the the time it's mined until it's um, converted and and uh, turned into um, a, a, a uranium hexafluoride gas that's enriched. The, the enriched uranium can be used to uh, produce a fuel. It can be used in reactors. The when it's done, the fuel can be reprocessed. Okay, but know what source material is, what um, special nuclear material is, and the different kinds of byproduct material. Those definitions are useful. Um, uh, yeah, um, 10 CFR 19, you have to have posting and training for workers. You're, you have, workers need to be notified about safety requirements. 10 CFR 20 are the basic standards for safety. What all the safety rules would be. Okay, um, I don't know that we need to go into all the details. We do know... Um, Oh, one thing I should mention that wasn't included with the, the part before about the alleys and the DACs, when you have airborne activity, you can reduce the exposure by using a respirator. Then when you calculate the, the, the dose using the DAC hours method or using the alley method that I described before, you can reduce it by the uh, assigned protective factor for the kind of respirator you're using. Okay. And these can be quite large, uh, 10,000 for a, a CBA uh, demand pressure respirator, for example. Um, uh, NRC has a lot of guidance documents that either reg guides or new reg documents uh, that are very useful. Uh, that's not really a test question about that, but when you start working using uh, new regs and, and uh, reg guides can, can simplify your life rather than having to reinvent the wheel. Questions? And let me see if I can find it. I didn't put up yet the um, part for detectors. Radiation detection. So important points to remember here. Second. Important point here for detection instruments is understanding uh, gas fill detectors are very important. And the important point about gas fill detectors is that um, understand, we already talked about how you uh, how to understand uh, ionization chambers and and you know how how dose is correlated to to this. But the, the other thing, important thing to remember to realize is this graph, the different. Um, regimes, the different voltage regimes, the, the ionization region, the proportional region, and the Geiger-Muller region. So understanding the different, how, how these different um, characteristics give rise to different instruments for different purposes. Ionization detectors are used primarily in current mode, and they're used for measuring, um, uh, for evaluating radiation fields, what the, the um, the air kerma rate or the dose rate is proportional re, uh, detectors are generally used more commonly for detecting uh, 
analyzing radioactive material to find out what the energy of the particular um, emitted by a particular isotope is. Geiger Mueller uh, does not have energy information. A count, uh, whatever, if something sets off the Geiger counter, all counts are counted the same. The energy deposited is not proportional to the energy of the radiation. And so the, the, those are the differences between those. So um, understanding that graph and how it applies is important. The other thing to, to note is, um, yeah. So this is proportional counter. The ionization takes place all near the wire. So it's proportional to the energy that's deposited. But in a Geiger counter, the entire tube gets uh, uh, ionized. Uh, so, um, okay. It's also important for in proportional counters in particular, um, you're able to discriminate alpha, rate, alpha particles from beta and gamma particles because the pulse heights are very different. The amount of energy that's deposited uh, uh, the, the amount of charge that's collected is much higher from an alpha particle than from a beta or gamma. So that um, in the lab, you're able to, to tell the, the, those two apart on, on a proportional counter. Guy counter, the whole thing gets ionized, as I said. Um, these, these slides that describe the differences of, of when different types of instruments are used is, is, is helpful. It would... Um, Understanding something about scintillation detectors and the photomultiplier tubes would be helpful. Um, and I don't. Understanding a spectrum from an MCA, from a, a scintillation detector, or from a semiconductor detector would be helpful. This is the Compton edge, this is the Compton plateau, this is a photo peak. Um, if, if, I hope these, if these don't ring a bell, speak up and I'll try to explain them. Photo peak is from photoelectric absorption. This is all energy that's deposited by Compton scattering inside the detector on uh, these, these Compton edges. Okay. When we use different detectors, uh, know something about efficiency. This will play into the next slide, which is about, um, I don't know that, I, uh, I'm not going to say I won't. Uh, this is about how to determine the, the um, uh, geometrical efficiency, how much of, uh, uh, from a, a source, how much of the angle, how much of the radiation that's emitted by that source is absorbed or intercepts the detector. That would be the geometric efficiency. Um, let's see. And that's what we had from that. And now counting statistics. There we go. So kind of things you need to know about counting statistics. You probably don't need to know all about these distributions, but understanding that the counting statistics um, that we calculate the count, uh, a net count rate, we take the rate of the sample minus the count rate of the background, and that's the count rate. Uh, the net count rate, that the uncertainty is the square, the, the standard deviation is the square root of this whole thing, it's the square root of the variance. And the variance is the count rate divided by the time for each one, add those all up. Count rate divided by the time for the sample, count rate divided by the time for uh, the background and add those, add those up and then take the square root gives us the uncertainty and the counts, okay? So far, so good. Okay, um, there is a formula that has been derived that tells you how to optimize the the counting time, how to divide it between the sample and the background count rate. G is for gross counts, and uh, uh, so this gives you the lowest uh, uncertainty overall. Uh, there's an example of it. This is just a graph that plots this uh, out for you. Um, 
And another important thing to remember, we talked about the net count rate, but that's just the count rate. It's not the activity. The activity has to be adjusted for the, the efficiency. Um, if I do an answer, I will probably give you an overall efficiency, not all these different um, components. Uh, so all this will just be some number like it was in the homework. I think in the homework it was 25% or something like that. And so you can calculate what the, when you have a count per minute, uh, you can only get the actual activity, the disintegrations per minute by dividing by the detection efficiency. Um, once you get the disintegrations per minute, then you need to convert units either to Becquerels or microcuries uh, based on the definitions of those. If you have uh, decays per minute, then uh, if there are so, however many decays per minute you have, you um, divide by 60 to get the decays per second because there are 60 seconds per, per minute. Um, and once you get Becquerel, you can change to Curies by the 3.7. 37 mega Becquerel is one millicurie. 37 kilo Becquerel is one microcurie, et cetera. Okay. And I think that brings us up to date, does it not? I don't think we've had any other lectures since then. So now let me ask what your questions are about this. I, I don't really have any questions. I, I think you've done a pretty good job okay. explaining that. Yeah, I just went, wanted to review what we what we touched on. Um, it's a lot of material. Uh, you, you can use your notes. So that will be helpful because to help manage the, the volume of material, right? You can look back and, and, and remind yourself of details. Um, and and uh, anybody else? If you or anybody who's uh, watching by a video, have questions of me, feel free to email me. I will respond as quickly as I can, and I will try to help you uh, work through the, the concepts, spend as much time as we need to. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I thank you all for taking time to come out and, and see this. I will have a, a test up for you. Uh, sometime tonight before tomorrow morning, and then you'll have a week to work on it. Okay. I appreciate your attention. Y'all have a good night. Thank you.